the course we exit the so we want to correct our exam now so let's just start question one given that g comma dot is a group with identity element please indicate whether you're following are groups by writing yes or no did anybody get it out which one is a group the answer is b yes so one e is not a group because e is an element not a set right remember it's a group so a e is not a group because e is a, an element not a set b is the only one that is a, a group c that is not a, a wait, that, that c is just c is just wrong right <laughs> e is not an element in this set single gun e is an element um, d e is not a set e is a set but brackets dots what is that that's not the operation yeah that's that's just weird so f is the same thing uh g e is not a set h um i and j the the dots brackets is not a set i have no idea what that is right um part two question two could i see all those who got this one off question two well done well done so it was a nice question do you all think so question two, let H, H be, yes, so this is questions I create, yes. So let H be that set, uh, the note addition as the normal addition, given that M is a subset of H, and given that M comma plus is a group, write the elements of M. So we know that M has to be, uh, has to contain elements, either zero to six, inclusive or not. Because it's a group means it has to be closed. And it has to have an identity. So the identity is zero. So zero must be in there. Yes. If we have any other elements in there, then it would not be closed. So therefore, it has to be singleton identity. You all find that brilliant, not so? Yeah. I should have made it a little more difficult and put, and put alpha, beta, gamma, etc. instead, where probably gamma is the identity. So then you'll have to probably what's going on, and then. <laughs> yes, so, so yeah. <laughs> but you all understand, right? Yeah. Nice. Um, three, state a necessary and sufficient condition for a non empty subset H to be a subgroup of a group G under the same operation. So, this is the time you need to learn, learn this by heart, word for word. A, B, yes, A, B, and first, right? Let G be a group and H be a non empty subset of G, then H is a subgroup of G, if and only if A, B, for A, B, and H, A, B, and versus an H. Yes? Now, Mr. Ramnanan would go through questions 4, 5, and 6, and 7, and 8. No, so I will go through section D and E now. Yes, yes. Oh, no, wait, look, we have question 3. We didn't do question 3, sir. 3 part B, 3 part B. Yeah, so y'all got this one on? Right? It was nice, wasn't it? It's a nice question, you know, it really gave you a feel. A feel. So, using the above term, otherwise, prove that H plus is a subgroup of Z plus where H is that and K is in Z. So, straightforward, we take two elements in our set H, we write how they look. And then we want to show that A, sorry, the L, H1 and H2 inverse is in H. So we have to show empty. We have to show non-empty first. So proof, 0 is in Z. Therefore, K by 0 is in Z, which means 0 is in H. So it's non-empty. So we take two elements in H, but elements in H are of the form Kn, where N is in Z. So A would be Kn1 and B would be Kn2. And we want to show that A minus B is in H. So A minus B is K N1 minus K N2. We factorize the K. We group the N1 minus N2 as in N3. So we've shown that A minus B is K N3, where N3 is N1 minus N2, and that is in Z because that is closed on the addition, yes? So therefore, we've shown that A minus B in H. Therefore, by the theorem, it shows that H is a subgroup of G. 
Everybody's okay? Perfect. Note. Since our operation is addition the inverse of an element, this is additive inverse. Um, okay, so that's just straightforward. Right? That note at the bottom there. So we are going on to section D, question 9. Define a homomorphism and an isomorphism for a group G. So this is straightforward from the notes. So we won't go there, homomorphism. Just remember the image of the of this product is the product of the images along with so that's homomorphism to make a homomorphism and isomorphism it has to be one to one and on to please be careful about domain and codomain when you're proving those things you will get zero well not will but you know i have to scare you right so <laughs> nine part b so we have the solutions there this is similar to an example we did before so it's straight from the notes nine c we did this yesterday it's the exact same thing, I just made it look better for you all. Question, section E, define a ring, this is from the notes. 10B, is that a ring, yes or no? Yes, no, we have one yes, can I see, can I see? All those for yeses. One, all those who didn't reach there? <laughs> is, come on, come on you all, take a minute, figure it out, figure it out. 10B. Yeah, we have two yeses. I just want to get a couple other nods. No, no, let it think, 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 think. Yeah. Right. It is because you have the zero identity. Right. And the multiplicative identity doesn't exist. It's not necessary for it to be a ring. You don't need to have no, you don't need to have the multiple. Exactly. Yeah. So you just have the attributes, your identity, so it is a ring. Yeah. Yeah. One plus one is two. One plus one is two. Well, yeah, one plus one is two. Oh, okay, well, never mind. <laughs> yes, it so it's not closed. You remember for it to be a, for it to be a ring, it has to be a group. Right? So, minus one, zero, one has to be a group under addition. But one plus one is two, which is not there. I purposely did it like that. So it is not, it looks really nice there. Eh? Look, yeah, it has everything. Yes, yeah. No, 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 no. Wait. Yeah, yes. Wait, Come on. Yeah. Two. Mm. Mm. One on one is two. <laughs> one on one is two. You all follow, right? Good. So I, I, I felt really well after I thought about that question as well. And everybody falls for it. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because by now they're in rings, right? And they figure the no groups are really good. And they just forget closure. Yeah. Um, ten part C define an ideal in R, which is in the notes. Anybody has any questions? The bonus questions on the next side, very quickly. Determine which of the following are groups under addition. The set A1 of rational numbers with absolute value less less than so it's be a one less than one together with with zero. So. It's under addition, so if we add three quarter plus three quarter, you're going to get one and a half, which is not less than one, so therefore it's not closed. Therefore it's not a group. Yes? Um, part B, the set A2 of rational numbers in lowest terms whose denominators are even. Anybody? Yes or no? So these things would take a, some algebra to work out, right? So I hope you all would have attempted this before. The answer is no, one sixth plus one sixth. So one sixth denominator even plus one sixth denominator even. Both in lowest terms, you can't reduce one sixth. When you plus them, you get two over six. Two over six cancel to give you a third. And a third, three is not even. So the denominator is not even, therefore it's not in the group. So therefore it doesn't, it's not closed as well. One part C. I would give you all some time to think about this, so the solutions will be uh, in the handout. So please attempt one, see if you all have not done so. Uh, question two in the bonus section. This is a standard proof that we did in class. I hope you all remember the proof. Lovely. Anybody has any questions on what I covered? Perfect. So right now I'd like to invite Mr. Ramanan to go through section B and C. Please give him a round of applause. So section B questions 
four, five, and six. These are straightforward, right? You all should be able to, uh, the, well, question four is straightforward. First of all, define the symmetric group on a non-empty set X. What is that? What's the definition of a symmetric group? That's the very first thing we did in symmetric groups. <laughs> okay, well, how high can I go with this? Uh, all right. Doesn't matter? Yeah. Right, so, well, I wouldn't write this down, but yeah, it's straightforward. Uh, if you have a, a non-empty group, a non-empty set X, then the symmetric group on X is the set of all bijections on X. So that was one mark. Uh, part B, list the elements of S3. This you all should have seen enough already. So S3 is, first element is the identity E, then you can say one, two, one, three. And that's all the elements. Should have six elements. Part C, how many elements are there in S4? What's the answer? Yeah, right. So the elements in Sn is n factorial, so 4 factorial is 24. So that is correct. Okay, now question five is just application of all the things we've done with uh, permutations and cycles and stuff in order to answer these questions. So we have two permutations, alpha and beta, part A, write alpha and beta as products of destroying cycles. So, let me know when you all finish writing this so I can erase it. All right, now I'm, I'm not gonna go through these steps, I'll just write the answers and you all, uh, if you want me to explain it, I can explain it. But it's straight, you want me to explain it? Okay. So first we have alpha is the permutation. One, two, five. All right, so if I have alpha as a product of these things, how do I simplify this into a product of destroying cycles? You all remember how to do that? Nope. Okay, so start with the smallest number, one. So we look at, remember we always go right to left. So we look at this cycle. This cycle says one is mapped to two. So we move on to the next cycle. There's no two here. We move on again. Now there's a two here, and two is mapped to three. So overall, one is mapped to two, and then it's mapped to three. So we can say one is mapped to three. Okay, so now we're looking at three. We wanna see what three is mapped to. So there's no three here, there's no three here. Here is mapped to four. So overall, alpha maps three to four. Yeah. So now we're looking at four. You don't go to, so we're trying to complete the cycle. So you have to look at the other, where this term is mapped to and then what this term is mapped to. So four, there's no four here. Four is mapped to five and there's no five here. So this thing overall is mapped to five. Now we're looking at five. Five goes to one and there's no other one. So it stays at one, which means that this cycle is done. Okay, um, what numbers are we missing? Two and six, so let's see two. Two goes to five, five goes to six, and it stays there. So we can say two goes to six, and you can check and see that six will also go to two. As long as two goes to six and all the numbers are used up, it has to go back to two. Okay, so that's alpha, now we need beta. So one, four, three, five inverse, one, two, seven, six, three, four, seven, five. When you have something like this, the first thing you do, you do is find, work out the inverses. So I have one, four, three, five inverse. You all remember how to find the inverse of a cycle? Well, not just the second fourth, you actually flip all the others, but in this case, because it's three, this one will stay 
But if it was four numbers, if it was five numbers in total, you would have to kind of reverse the last four. Now, there's, a, there's another way to do it, which is, which is just you reverse all and then rearrange it so that one, one comes first. It's just, it, it, it works out to be the same both ways. I didn't show you that way because it, it's actually more working to figure it out. So this you can write as one, five, three, four. And then I can write these back. And to simplify this, we do the same as we did above here. So y'all can y'all can tell me what this works out to be. What is one map to? All right, and it stays there. What about two? Seven. Two goes to seven. All right. What does seven go to? Three. Correct. What about three? Okay. All right, that's correct. So we have alpha, we have beta. Next thing, what is alpha beta? So multiply this by this. What's that? Okay. That's correct. So I'm not. You all can work out the final details. You write this, then you write this after it, and then you simplify it to get this. Well, not uh, simplify, but you, you look at what the mapping does to each of the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. So part C is write alpha and beta, well, write the product alpha beta as a product of disjoint cycles. And what is this as a product of disjoint, uh, sorry, transpositions, not disjoint cycles? Not two, seven, two, four. You have to flip the last two. So two, four, two, seven. And you can check that this is the same as this. Look at what things I'm up to. All right, so that's it. Part D, state the order and parity of alpha, beta. So what is the order of a, a permutation? How do you find the order of a permutation? Not transpositions, destroying cycles. So you look at these. I have one of order of or length two, one of length three. So the LCM of two and three is six. So the order of this is six. And lastly, parity. How do you get that? Parity and order have nothing to do with each other. With each other. Just check the number of transpositions. If that is odd, then it's odd. If it's even, then it's even. I have three here, so it's odd. So which means it's an odd transposition. Okay. <laughs> there are other ways you can. There are other ways. There are other ways you can think of it to work it out. But this is the least confusing way. Just write it as transpositions and then check that. You, there are ways you can manipulate this to figure it out. So, for example, you can say I have an even. Is an even multiplied by an? Sorry. Actually, this is an odd, right? Because yeah. it's. Is it odd or is it even? Yeah. <laughs> Why? It's even, remember? It's okay, now everybody's confused. Is, this, is, is one six odd or even? Remember, okay. Odd, because it's one transposition. Remember, if it's, if it's the number of transpositions. Also, remember, remember the theorem says if the length of the cycle is even, then it's an odd. If the length of the cycle is odd, then it's an even. So this is an odd. This is an even. Yeah. Now, even though you're multiplying them, think of addition. If you add an even and an odd, what do you get? Odd. Right. So overall, this will be an odd. But that can be more confusing if you think about it that way. The easiest way 
break it down into transpositions and then All right, question six. Determine the elements of S4 that leave invariant this expression. X1 cubed plus X2 squared plus X3 X4. That's probably too high, but anyway, you all know what it is. X1 cubed plus X2 squared plus X3 um, X4. I don't know if you all remember how to do this part. Um, so how do we get the, remember the, we want the elements of S4. We want permutations. We are permuting the elements x1 to x4. So in this expression, what can x1 be mapped to? Can it be mapped to x2? No, no because then you get x2 cubed, and there's no x2 cubed in this. Similarly, it can't be mapped to x3 or x4, because you need x1 cubed. So x1 has to be mapped to x1. And similarly, x2 has to be mapped to x2, because you need x2 squared. So the only ones you can permute uh, x3 and x4, right? So you can map them to themselves, or you can map x3 to x4 and x4 to x3. So the answer for question six is just the permutations E, which is the identity, and three, four. So we map x3 to x4 and x4 to x3. But the key here is x1 has to go to itself and x2 has to go to itself. Now there's a, a little bit of explanation you have to give, which is what I said, um, to actually completely answer the question, but I mean, overall, this is the answer. All right, um, question seven. What did you all do for question seven? <laughs> question seven is so easy. Okay, I shouldn't say it's so easy, but it's, it's, it's easy. There are different ways you could think of it. Okay, part A. So we have a group G, and we have H defined by G inverse for all elements G and G. Prove that H is a subgroup of G. How do we prove something is a subgroup? We use the subgroup test. So first thing we need to do is show non-empty. Now, Think of what H is. H for every element G and G, we take the inverse, and that is the element of H. Now, if you think of it that way, what is H really? H is the inverse of every element in G. So, what is H? Okay, we will come. Think of what element. We will come back to it just now. So, E is an element of G. If E is in G, since E is, if e is the identity in G, then E inverse is going to be in H. But what is E inverse? E. So since E is E inverse, is in H, H is non-empty. So we have non-empty. Okay, next step. Let H1 and H2 be two elements in H. So if these are elements in H, we need to prove that H1, H2 inverse is in H, using a subgroup test. Okay, well, before we do that, if these two are elements of H, right, by the definition of H, then we must have H1 is G1 inverse, H2 is G2 inverse. For some elements, For some elements, G1 and G2 in G. That's the definition of each inverses. So, if we have this, we need to show H1, H2 inverse is in each. All right, for closure. Well, for the, sorry, for the subgroup test. So, what is this? This H1, H2 inverse, I, I know what H1 is, I know what H2 is, so I can substitute those in here. This is going to be G1 inverse times G2 inverse inverse. Now I can simplify this, but I don't want to do that now. Do you all remember the property AB inverse is B inverse A inverse? So I apply that to this. This, this is my A and this is my B. Well, actually it's the other way around. This is my A and this is my B. 
right? So in other words, B inverse, A inverse is going to be A, B, all inverse. Okay, so now G2 inverse times G. G1 and G2 are in G, which means that G2 inverse is also in G. Remember, G is a group. So these two elements are in G, and because G is a group, by closure, this is in G. So I can say this is equal to G3 inverse, for some element G3, which is equal to that, in G. And because I have the inverse of an element in G, it means that this belongs to H. And therefore, by the subgroup test, this thing is a subgroup. Because we've shown non-empty and we've shown um, if I take two elements, then one times the inverse of the other is in the group, in the subgroup. All right, part B. So we've shown as a subgroup, now we have to show as a normal subgroup. Let G be an element of G and H be an element of H. You all remember how to prove something is a normal subgroup? We need to take an element in G, take an element in H, and consider G inverse H, G. We have to show that this is in H. Now, in the question, there was something that was given that was not used yet. What is it? What's that? It's abelian, right? And that's important. Because G is abelian, remember G is in G, H is in H, but H is a subgroup of G, so H is also in G. So because it's abelian, I can switch these two elements. So this is H, G inverse G, which is H, E, because G inverse G is E, which is H. And I know H is in H. So it means that this is in H. And therefore we're done. So we've shown that it's a normal subgroup. Now I'm leaving out the last line where we say hence the result follows and stuff, just to save time. Okay, question eight part A state Lagrange's theorem, what is it? I have the order of a subgroup of A joint to G must be a device of the order of G. Okay, yeah, missing one important word. G has to be a finite group. So you lost half a mark here, or half the marks. So that's important. You need a, a finite group. If you leave what you would finite, it no longer works. You need a finite group, and you need a subgroup H. Then the number of elements in H is a divisor of the number of elements in G. Or the order of H is a divisor of the order of G. So that's part A. That's straight out of the notes. Part B, okay, so part B is just applying Lagrange's theorem. So let's look at the possibilities. So I have one, two, five, seven, nine. Okay, I'm gonna run out of space. Is one possible? Yep, what's the, what's the index? Yep. It's just the order of G divided by the order of H. The order of G is 120, the order of H is one. Uh, this one. What about five? What about seven? Nope, what about nine? 15. That's eight or something like that. Uh, 60. Yeah. Alright, there's one I didn't write down here. 240. 
No, and the reason being 240 is bigger than 120, so it could, there's no way it could divide it. So 240 is no. And that's it. All right, so uh, we've gone through all the questions on the papers, on the qu exam papers, so I think that's it. Okay, um, actually, so there's one thing, come back to question seven. I said, I told you all to think about something. What is H really in relation to G? But what is the inverse of G? What's the inverse of a group? There's a, a group can't have an inverse. So there's, there's no definition for the inverse of a group. You can have the inverse of all the elements in a group, but what is that? Okay, okay, think of, think of, think of it this way. H is a subgroup of G. Lagrange's theorem says what? Well, okay, we can't use Lagrange because it's not finite. So, okay, not that. Um, H is a subgroup of G, so H is a subset of G. So the number of elements in H is what in relation to the number of elements in G? Is smaller than or is equal to? Okay, so we have that. Now, take an element in H. Let, so let H be an element of H. Then there exists G in G such that this means such that, you all know, right? Yeah. Such that H is G inverse. So what is H inverse? implies G is an element in So what does that tell you? Actually, I should have started this differently. I should have said let G be an element in G and then go on from that. But anyway, so we have an element in G and then that is also in H. Right, so it means that H is a, well, G is a subset of H. This is not really a formal proof of it, but I'm telling you that. Yeah. Which means that they're equal. And if you think about it, think of it intuitively. You have a group G, and you take the inverse of every element in G. G is a group, so it's closed. So every element has, and we know that every element has an inverse. So when you take, so you can think of, think of it this way. You take G, and you separate it into elements what, who, that are self inverses, and then let's say A and A inverse. In other words, this in this set A would be A inverse. In this set, A and A inverse are uh, distinct. So whatever elements you have here, E is a self self inverse, and you have the others. So these elements are going to be in each. Right now, if Let's say I have, I take, I take this element in G is going to be mapped to this element in H. And similarly, this element in G is going to be mapped to this element in H. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So it, it means that they must have the same number of elements. So they're equal. Um, so after you have benefited, you understand how much you benefit, help people. Please help people, either physically help them or send them, tell them, send an email to me. If you all want, please write a testimonial, come and do a short video so we post it up online so we, we get it to be better, better, and that's, that's good. Stop me, you can stop me, so if you're viewing this online, you've never seen me, and you see me around, hey sir, you know, I saw your videos, thanks so much for helping me out. I love those things, that's what I live for. Right, so just to sum up, because this is the last time we're going to record. 
when I did it, Jay did it first, and Jay told me that you know responsibility for me was to do it for you all. And now I'm not telling you all the responsibility of you all is to do it for people. I'm just saying your responsibility you all is to just share and get people to do it, right? Uh, so who made this possible would have been me. And uh, three years ago, I said, it's a huge mantle to, to teach abstract algebra, especially if you're not in it. And I'm not in abstract algebra. That's not my field, right? So I spoke with Mr. Ramnanan. I was like, Jagdish, you know, I need some help. And he is always willing to help. So please give Mr. Ramnanan a applause. <laughs> and he has, he has helped throughout all the three years. He has consistently done his topic, which is the second session, and he's excellent at it. So he, he's there, he's there. He's, he's there with you, left, right, and center. So it's me, it's him. Then in the earliest, we had Mr. Sach Mulchan, uh, Diana. Then we had Amal, we had Chandra, sorry, we had Kavita. We had Kavita, who, is, who compiled all the notes and added the extra notes, made sure everything was proper. We got some assistance from the lecturer, Mr. Daga himself, he guided me. Then we had uh, the postgrad help desk as well, also helped me create some questions. Um, myself, then I'll add my study community, who was in charge of recording for free. Thank you very much, my study community. <laughs> And uh, again, because this was my responsibility, we have grown from face to face. In the first year, literally, that was it. Second year, we got PDF notes. And the third year, we have websites as well as Facebook, as well as compiled notes, which is complete. And now we're going online. So, which is a huge, huge success. <laughs>